My guest today has worked as a multimedia journalist, editor, producer and publisher for close on 25 years now, with her work appearing in leading South African newspapers like the Sunday Times, the Mail and Guardian and City Press, as well as internationally in India's Hindustan Times and the Guardian in the UK. Dr. Nakhama Brody is a force in local journalism, holding the industry accountable for integrity and accuracy above all. The part-time lecturer is also 10 books deep, with her latest publication, Farm Killings in South Africa, following hot on the heels of her 2020 book, Femicide in South Africa. She joins me now. Welcome, Nakhama. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for a, a really nice welcome. I was like, who is that person that she's talking about? She sounds really interesting. It's you. You are really interesting. And I'm so <laughs> pleased to have you on the podcast and here to, to pick your brain on this and writing about violence in the media, particularly with uh, in terms of farm killings. Uh, congratulations on the publication of this book. After 10 books, is the unboxing still a thrill? Like when you get the... The hard copy in your hands, do you still get that that feeling? Yeah, it is really, um, there is nothing that compares to physically holding a book in your hands. And you know, I, I wrote my first book when I'd already been a journalist for 10 or 12 years, I think. And even at that point, I, I understood that there was a, a massive difference in terms of how people saw you or perceived your work when it was in a newspaper or a magazine compared to a book and you know we had these terrible few years of lockdown and um, the pandemic where bookstores themselves were restricted and a lot of book sales were restricted and so uh, to get back to a point where we reminded of the actual you know the enjoyment of the physicality of holding a bound printed piece of paper in your hands is um, it's good to be back um, although uh, a very daunting topic so mm. not so much joy but uh, definitely a sense of um, purpose and pride that you know the book is finished and done, and I think it I think it's a, a good product um, tackling a very difficult topic. So I've just finished this title, Farm Killings in South Africa, which mentions very very briefly in in the text um, that it is part of a bigger project. I'm making an assumption here, but is it possibly the second in a series that started with Femicide in South Africa, which you published in in 2020? It is going to be part of a series. Um, I don't know what the next book is going to be in the series, but the idea is to really explore different aspects of fatal violence in South Africa. So even when I wrote the femicide book um, and it came out two years ago, and that was based on on my on my um, doctoral thesis research but it was very apparent that uh, we had a femicide problem within a much broader homicide problem mm -hmm. and we can't understand the murder of women without also exploring what you know how men are killed in South Africa because the majority of victims of murder in South Africa are men and the majority perpetrators of murder in South Africa are also men. So it's a sort of strange context that we have to unpack. Um, but certain types of killings tend to get a lot more media attention. Um, femicide being one of them, farm killings being probably the largest category to get media attention. For a very small number of killings, it gets uh, significant media attention covered to all other killings, whether it's murders of women, murders of children. Um, and these narratives, the ones that tend to get a lot of focus in the media, also tend to drive our understanding as a society of how we think murder works, um, who's at risk of becoming a victim, and who we should be fearing as a perpetrator. And the problem is that the media coverage isn't always accurate. So the idea is, over time, um, to and I'm, I'm building data on this in my academic work as well. I'm building a homicide media tracker that will allow us to capture hopefully decades worth of press reports about murders in South Africa, but we'll eventually sort of look at different types of murders and really give us a much fuller picture because if we only look at a small part of the picture, we, we risk not understanding it correctly. So I spotted the book in exclusive books and a thought occurred to me um, that there are going to be several people, let's call it a, a particular demographic, who will pick up the book, likely not knowing who you are, and expect an expose on white genocide. But this is not the case with this book, as you've mentioned Yeah, in context of numbers and the right data, etc. The book is balanced by and backed by lucid data, but you know how things go. 
Uh, do you think you'll be criticised for ignoring the quote unquote plight of farmers or having a leftist agenda? I already been criticised for that. <laughs> um, before the book even came out, literally before I even got my own first copies of it, I uh, posted something on social media and immediately my timeline started filling up with anonymous accounts, usually very brave people who are anonymous on social media, but all criticizing the the faults in my book, which they couldn't possibly have read because it wasn't even in the shops yet. Um, so yeah, uh, it's a, it's a difficult topic to discuss. People have very uh, hard rooted, deep rooted ideas for themselves of how they understand the problem. And many of us, unfortunately, understand the problem in the wrong way because we've been uh, convinced by rhetoric instead of by facts. Mm. And it's very hard to talk people back from that ledge once they sort of talk themselves onto it. So yeah, there, there has been, um, there will continue to be no doubt criticism um, for either underrepresenting or dismissing or however people perceive it, um, the plight of white Afrikaners. But as I, I've really tried to make apparent in years of work, I mean, I've been working on this topic, not just in this book, but you know, 10 years ago, nearly 10 years ago when I wrote a report for Africa Check, is I have never once claimed that these attacks and these murders don't happen. What I've always and consistently said is that we are not representing them correctly and we are missing important context. And that unfortunately, these types of crimes and this level of violence is not unique in South Africa. It is much more widespread than many people realize and affects many more people. But the reason we are not aware of other people being affected is because the media almost exclusively tends to focus its coverage on murders and attacks of white victims. And so we, we miss out on a whole bunch of other information that makes it look as if one set of South Africans is being particularly targeted when in fact we are all, not not all everybody, but people who live in rural areas, people who live in farming areas, people who live in uh, settlements in agricultural areas, there are, you know, incredibly widespread experiences of violence. And we don't have the full picture. And without that full picture, we are not going to be able to develop a solution that is going to keep all of us safe. As you mentioned, and I think it's actually in the, what do you call it, a back blurb? A blurb, a blurb, back blurb. Sorry, um, a blur, the blurb, as you mentioned in the blurb, yeah. um, it touches on that. On one page, 138, sorry. If politics loves a platform, then conspiracy theories love a vacuum. And then yeah. how far murders, the response to them is often political, but not mm. they're not committed for political reasons. So, yeah, yeah sorry, those is, two tied in for me, those two ideas. yeah. yeah. Someone asked me a question last week when they said, why was I emphasizing the political response to farm killings now uh, and not uh, acknowledging the individual political responses to farm killings maybe 60 years ago, 70 years ago, if we look at in some of the earlier chapters when I look at farm killings in Bethel and stuff like that, the killings of farm workers. Um, and we have I've seen a shift where, you know, in the, the 1940s, the 1950s, most people don't know, or maybe we've forgotten that we had a very long system of using prison labor or using farms um, to, to allow prisoners, often convicted of very petty crimes, to serve out their sentences and providing free or cheap labor for farmers. And many of the conditions that those laborers worked in were terrible, uh, and the whole system was very corrupt and unethical. Um, and deliberately done so that farms could access cheap or free labor. Um, but the response at that point was much more grounded in what we would understand as pre-labor unions. It was before the ANC had even been banned, um, even pre-apartheid, but especially during the early years of apartheid, workers themselves had far less political clout or political power. So the types of protests and the way it was engaged in were, were sort of different. But you had journalists like Ruth First and Henry Ngumalo uh, covering those types of stories quite prominently. But what we see now in the current context, and this has really been since 1994, is that um, you know we have our, our major political parties. If we look at, say, the top three, we look at the ANC, the official opposition, the DA, the EFF, but then we look at the Freedom Front, for example, which is the fifth largest political party. It's still quite small, but it's still the fifth largest, um, where these parties understand that the issue of farm killings, whether it's the killing of a farm laborer or the killing of a white farmer, um, 
that these issues are very hot button topics for, you know, for their communities. And so their response to it, reading years and years of, of media reports, is, it's very clear that the politicians' response to these types of violence and these types of crimes is really about the politicians' goals and aims and ambitions rather than actually building security for their constituents. Um, and again, this is, you know, the ANC is apathetic. The DA is um, expedient, you know, jumps on any issue it feels like it can kind of think might score back some of its voters that it lost to the Freedom Front. Um, the EFF similarly jumps on, you know, every time that happens, they, they also kind of want to get coverage. They'll show up in force in town. Uh, we saw this very much in Cynical. The Freedom Front Plus also is, is playing on people's fears and they've seen their, you know, their numbers grow over the last few years. So they're obviously doing this very successfully. But when I look at the responses that most of these leaders contribute, none of them are actually trying to make a genuine improvement to the safety and security of communities' lives. They're just looking to get miles and inches and airtime, which is, I think, inexcusable. What happened in Siena Cole, you mentioned that the, the, the political response to Brendan Horner's death in 2020, he was a Paul Rue resident, and this was the one item news item in particular that you mentioned inspired you your research into the topic but not necessarily your research your your decision to write this book your decision to sort of uh for really a lack of a better term pull the trigger on this, on this book <laughs> so i wasn't looking to to write about farm killings because first of all when i had previously written about the to- topic i had a um, i came under attack from a lot of different sides so i got at one point, I got charged with hate speech at the Human Rights Commission by the Freedom Front uh, and Steve Hoffmeyer and Sunette Bridges and some other people because I'd made, as a related statement, I'd made a comment that white women were at risk of being murdered by their partners. And this was seen as hate speech against white men. Um, I mean, the, the charge was dismissed, but it was still, you know, and, and I've had weird stuff online from those similar groups over the years where I've been sent sort of pictures of me inside a gas chamber and all sorts of unpleasant things. So it wasn't like an area that I wanted to go into because I knew immediately it would attract quite a lot of negative attention um, from people who were not particularly willing to read the facts, but were very, yeah, brutal, anti-Semitic, just unpleasant. Um, but, and, and also, you know, when you look at the data, so I research all murders, um, farm killings, any of the figures that we have available and the figures are often confusing, but whichever figures you use, they make up a really small proportion of murders each year. I mean, you know, they make up less than half a percent of all the murders that happen in South Africa. I mean, less than half a percent. So why is it that they really dominate the landscape on crime, violence, Mm -hmm. fear, all those sorts of things. And when the events happened in Seneca, I saw the responses to it from the farming community, from the EFF, from the police. Um, and it really did feel for those few days in Seneca, like, I mean, we were on a bit of a knife set anyway, because we were in the middle of a pandemic and things were very, I think, tense. But it was really the kind of situation where if there had been one more incident, you know, like one more police car set on fire, if a shot had been fired, if if the line or the barbed wire line between the EFF and the white farmers hadn't held, like, that could have broken out into something. Um, I mean, we saw something maybe worse with the July riots last year, but this was, you know, this mur- this one murder of a young farmer boy, well, farmer young man, um, really had had the potential to sort of tip over into something so much larger. And it made me realize that maybe I was letting my own, I don't know, fear or whatever, stop me from covering what was obviously very important. So at that point, I sort of decided that that was going to be the next book um, in the series and you correctly identified, you know, so that we want to do more of these kind of books because we have a violence problem in South Africa. Um, we can't ignore it. We can't walk away from it. The only way I think that we're going to solve it, there's two things that we need. No, two, three things. We need better information. We need to understand the problem better. And that is why I do the work that I do, because I build data and I hope that I can help people to understand the problem better so that we understand things based on facts instead of myths. The second thing is that we need our government to actually come up with a decent strategy and to put decent management in place and to stop 
constantly politicizing or seeking political advantage from crime and violence. I mean, I really do think that, I believe that many people who work in the police services are absolutely doing their best, but also we know that management and, you know, ministries and that sort of stuff are not always so great. Um, Our provision of data is not great. There's many faults Mm. there and the government could do a lot better uh, for a lot more people. Um, But the, the, and the final thing, and this is really the, the key, and this relates back to understanding the problem better, is we're all in this together. We have to develop a solution together. There is no solution for violence in this country that only fixes violence for white people. Uh, it just doesn't work, you know? Um, and um, we also know from studying other types of violence, including xenophobic violence, that, for example, communities that are cohesive, communities that look after each other are much less likely to experience outbreaks of xenophobic violence because there are no cracks in which that violence can sort of take root. Um, so we really have to start learning how to look after each other and care about each other, care about the outcomes for other people. Mm-hmm. And the only way that's going to work is if we start seeing other people as actual people, mm-hmm. you know, and, and when you read the sort of narrative around farm killings is you cannot escape the conclusion that for, for centuries um, is that white farmers have not viewed black South Africans as people and we should not be surprised when, you know, reciprocally, um, many uh, Black South Africans who live in a context of, of farm environment um, have, first of all, have, are experiencing the effects of being dehumanized, but also you can't expect them to, to humanize you when you have dehumanized them. And this is the legacy that we live with. We can't say, oh, well, we must just forgive and forget. It doesn't work that way. We've got to work at it, you know. To put it really simply, and but I, I'd like to unpack it more with you, it's the whole concept of hurt people hurt people, right? So I, if I can, spoiler alert, um, it's not a, a work of fiction, so I hope you don't mind. Your final words of the book tie into this really nicely. If we continue to let fear rather than knowledge drive the story, we will continue to live on a land that we cannot enjoy. Um, it's, um, that's exactly it. It's like... It, so again, the, the the narrative is that farm murders are some recent thing. And this is very strongly positioned by a lot of the sort of um, let's say Africana nationalist, white, you know, white nationalist type publications, where, you know, before 1990, everything was brilliant, you know, except for that apartheid issue. But like it was great, you know, and people were safe and they had these lovely lives. Um uh, which is not true. I mean, you look at media reports. Okay, the scale of violence now is is more, but we've had farm murders of white farmers for well forever. Yes, actually. so I was going to say as well. I was going to say violence um, on farms in South Africa is not a post nineteen ninety four thing, no. as you as you point no. out in the book. This is as old as colonialism in South Africa itself. The second thing is, we know that. Um, there's a deep love of land. There's a deep love of place, of space. There is, uh, you know, deep connections. People have, whether it's newer connections forged by, whether it is an Afrikaans family that, you know, has been working in kind of this a uh, farming area for 200 years or 100 years or whatever it is, there's still, it's a very real connection. Um, and the more you read through literature is that actually everybody except for people who were often wrenched away from their land or people who are now growing up kind of disconnected and, you know, delocated. Um, But you read sort of Sol Plyke's work from 1913, talking about farmers moving then. And, you know, we've never really in South African literature even allowed for a deep connection with the land for black South Africans. That's beyond something like tribal and primitive Mm. um, where, and, and that is through, you know, that's happened through our media and through our literature where, you know, you have the Place Roman, so you have these Afrikaans kind of farm novels, which are these great, epic, you know, heroic adventures. And where is the Black Place Roman, you know, because it exists. Mm-hmm. There are Black farmers um, and landowners that have the same kind of connection. Anyway, so we have all these different types of connections, but the point is we all bloody love it, okay? Mm-hmm. We actually love being here. We give us the cheesy African sunset behind the acacia tree, please. Like there is something, honestly, I challenge any South African living in South Africa or living in another country to imagine in their mind a sunset across the bushveld or their favorite landscape. If you live in the Cape and you don't like the bushveld, maybe you're mad, but it's to picture that feeling and not 
feel that deep sense of longing you know it's mm. like I mean for white South Africans we this is why we love Johnny Clegg like we you know we listen to Johnny Clegg and we get that feeling we, we watch Jock of the Bushveld and we get that feeling we you know it's like we all have this connection and we need to remind ourselves that we are cutting ourselves off from the ability to enjoy this land that we communally love deeply mm. um, by simply not seeing each other Semantics comes up a lot in this book, which I mm. think if, you, you know, a lot of people are very um, flippant about it. Oh, that's just semantics. It means nothing. But there is, there's a lot in this book that showed me that words have meaning. How things are phrased and legally defined, yeah. words like torture or the phrase genocide or Volksmord, yeah. and how they show yeah. up in the media are dissected in this book to show how context changes meaning. Um, your choice of the, the phrasing farm killings as opposed to farm yes. murders or farm attacks or even an expose into white genocide or an expose into yeah. the myth of white genocide. Why go with farm killings as a title instead of any of the previous titles I just mentioned? So farm murders has a very specific context. And, you know, at some point quite early on in the book, I say, you know, that there's actually there's no legal definition of a farm murder. There's no nothing on our statutes that says a farm murder is what we have is murder. We have murder, attempted murder. We have culpable homicide, which is the difference between murder and culpable homicide is intent. So culpable homicide is when you kill somebody through negligence or an accident, whereas murder is you intended to kill that person. Um, even femicide isn't a legal category. You don't go and charge someone with femicide, you know, at, at court. They charged with murder. Um, and this is a problem. We need to sort of remind ourselves that, you know, actually legal definitions do exist and they're important because you can't, for example, go and say no bail for femicide mm. when it, mm. it doesn't exist as a legal category. Mm. Um, with farm killings is, I chose killings for a number of reasons. First of all, even though we don't have a definition for farm murders legally, it is so commonly used that it has a definition. Like, a, and there are also, by the way, definitions in safety and security plans about farm murders, but those are not legal. They're not like legally binding. They're just sort of changeable things. But the common use of farm murders is so specific that when you say a farm murder, everyone knows what you mean. And a farm murder means the killing of a white person uh, on an agricultural or rural land, not always even a farm. And because it's so specific, I didn't want to use farm murders in the title because that then excludes a whole bunch of other people who are killed on farms. The other thing is that I'm not making a finding about, you know, guilt or culpability or, you know, some of the deaths that I include in my book would have been culpable homicides, not murders necessarily. Um, some of them never went to court. So, you know, I'm including a wide range of killings, but I'm basically saying who gets killed on a farm or on farmland? Um, because that gives us sort of the widest definition possible, because then we include uh, farm owners, we include farm laborers, you include the families of farm laborers, you include visitors to farms, you include passengers, you know, tra people transiting through farms. And then potentially, and what I also look at is you include communities around farms who sort of supply those areas. So it was intentional to sort of just slightly break away, to make it very clear what we're talking about, but to break away from this very socially constructed concept of farm murders um, and to remind ourselves that the discussion any discussion around killings on farms needs to include more than just white farm owners otherwise we, we are having a very blinkered discussion mm. i um you so you, i enjoyed reading about what happened in bethel um to precursor that you've dedicated this project to anti-apartheid activist ruth first um as you've mentioned and, and as well as mr drum the late investigative journalist henry uh, henry nkumalo uh, mm -hmm. we stand upon the shoulders of giants is what you say. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's chat about that story of Bethel. I really, I really enjoyed reading it. I don't think it's these stories are told enough um, yeah. among South Africans, I, particularly the potato boycott <laughs> leading up yeah. to that. I, I agree. I don't think they're told enough. So Henry Gamalo and Ruth First were both journalists. And obviously, Gamalo became better known as Mr. Drum. And he, he would have maybe become many things. But unfortunately, he was killed while he was investigating an assignment a few years later. Um, so he was he was doing a deep investigative piece. And he got assassinated, essentially, probably as a result of the piece. It was on um, illegal abortions, mm. backstreet abortions. Which, um, I mean, I read that when I read that, I was like, come on, this guy was just... 
Was yeah. he so ahead of his time? He really, uh, you know, he did phenomenal things and he he embedded himself in stories in ways that I certainly know none of my colleagues, we would, none of us would do today. He was incredibly brave and ethical and diligent in his work. Um, he exploded so many important stories and, and did them in a particular way. Um, and I think, you know, one of the problems with that is that our systems of archives in South Africa, for example, it's very hard to get your hands on copies of the old drum magazine. Um, Which, so can we, we talk can about we just it a lot. talk about what bullshit that is? Yeah, I mean, that we a, don't have access I have a bigger, to that. <laughs> I have a bigger problem with, so you can, if, if you want to, if you go to Vitz, for example, the Africana Library does have hard copies of the old issues. But you know, we live in an age of digitization and the fact that mm. in my view, right, the fact that there isn't a free, mm. free, free, everyone can access a free archive of every single back issue of Drum Magazine for everyone in the world to read, including students at school or mm. whatever it is, or someone on their phone, I think is just a, I think it's a moral crime because if we don't share those stories with people, then A, those stories will be forgotten, then people won't understand how we got here. So we always ask this question when we research the past is how does that inform how we got here? And that's why the work of Henry Gamalo and Ruth First was so important. So um, Ruth First was, I mean, she was at that point writing as a journalist for a number of different publications. And she was obviously very liberal and very left, left wing. Um, and, you know, the, Going into Bethel, so it's it's kind of like Bethel at that time, this is in the sort of late 1940s, early 1950s, Bethel was the standout place. Bethel was the most notorious farm area in the country for mistreating its workers. It was regularly investigated and publicized in the press as being this terrible place where farm owners were basically taking in prisoners through the uh, kind of petty offenders scheme and abusing them on their farms, not feeding them, clothing them in sacks, um, charging them for the privilege of basically living and working on the farm. So these, so it was a system that basically incarcerated young black men, forced them to work on farms for almost nothing and trapped them in that system. And it, this was deliberate. I mean, we basically, so many other scholars have written about this, but we basically created a prison system in such a way as that it would feed into a forced labor system. And um, and this had many repercussions, and this was only stopped in the 1980s, you know, so it actually persisted for many, many years. At one point, and in fact, this is something that intrigues people. South Africa, by the way, still has one of the largest prison populations in the world, in the world, okay? After the United States and Russia, South Africa has the third largest prison population in the world. And we come from this long history of, yeah, incarcerating people. Anyway, so, so there's a whole bunch of other issues that sort of come out of that one small thing. Um, but you look at the work of these early journalists, and they were also covering work that church leaders were doing. And what they were doing is they were investigating the conditions in Bethel and the, the levels of unfairness, um, judicial unfairness, physical unfairness that were happening and being inflicted on kind of young black men um, who were often picked up by sort of the past police in town. So basically, if you committed some kind of a petty offense, like you didn't have your passbook uh, or it had expired or you were in the wrong place or you were unemployed for the day. In fact, even if you were employed and they didn't believe you, they would arrest you. And then they would often um, con the, the men who they'd arrested and they'd say, well, OK, um, if you go and work on a farm for six months, then we won't charge you. You won't have to go to jail. So you could serve time on the farm instead of serving your jail sentence. Um, but there was no due process. And a lot of the time the men were conned into serving sentences that were longer on the farm than it would have been had they served jail time in court. Anyway, so this was this whole system to keep feeding into the Bethel system. And, you know, the descriptions of the conditions on the farm are repeated year after year after year. There was one, there was a, a church leader, Michael Scott, who went and he basically said that the conditions in Bethel were worse than slavery. Mm. Um, and then, again, as you said, these things kind of continued for, for a long time. We had the potato boycotts. You had all these really interesting things that were also quite fundamental to the formation of the ANC just before it got banned. So this is the other, if you read through those stories, like Bethel in kind of the 1950s, you've got, you know, Kurt Sebande there working, representing the laborers. And he's he's from the ANC. And it's so weird to read an issue of this kind of apartheid era press where the ANC is still mentioned. But, we're, you know, it's before the organization gets banned. But this mm. is kind of a precursor to what is going to happen as they get banned. Another thing, and I didn't really mention this enough in the book because it sort of goes on another tangent. But if anybody's interested in that, they can read Charles Van Onselen's book, um, uh, Cuss Miner, about a sharecropper, Cuss Miner, the, the seed is mine. 
And that's a twenty twenty two book, right? No, it no, it's, 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 it's it older. No, it's older than that. But it's 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 a classic, and he really looks at. There's a discussion that happens post apartheid where it suddenly starts to dawn on black residents on farms. So they weren't landowners because they had they weren't allowed to own land, but they'd often lived on farms for generations. And there was sort of an understanding in terms of ownership or usership and rights and whatever. And there's this kind of gradual understanding as these new apartheid laws come into place that not only are they not going to ever be allowed to own their own land, that that's the only land they've ever known, um, but that they're also going to be removed from that land. And when you read the stories of how that realization, like the penny drops at community meetings and stuff like that. And it's an absolute tragedy. It's like the most devastating. It's unbearable. It's unbearable to read. Mm. Um, and, and so all of these things are happening at the same time. So you have these men being forced to work on farms, creating this massive kind of carceral labor system. You have other black families where this is the start of really forced removals from farms. Um, under apartheid legislation. And it's just this rolling tragedy that also sets the the landscape really for violence and conflict that still haunts us now. Mm. And it's so important that we understand that past because people who weren't, people who think they weren't affected by it are so quick to dismiss it. But, you know, we're not looking at, you know, a thousand years ago. We are looking at things that people still have memories of. Um, And, and we don't have, we can't have two sets of rules. You know, it's like, I mean, I, I'm Jewish. We come from a tradition where every year you have to remember that once you were slaves in Egypt, thousands of years ago. Mm. But, you know, and even we, we remember the, the Jewish Holocaust and the Second World War, which is also, you know, several decades ago now. It's these traumas that people experience don't suddenly leave as the one, you know, as one generation dies out the next, they are passed on through multiple ways. But I mean, through memories, through physically, through through disempowerment, disenfranchisement, it's so important that we actually acknowledge the past. You know, this wasn't, this wasn't an empty land. Mm. This was never an empty land. And the very foundations of agriculture in any country, actually, except for maybe parts of Europe, but maybe those were feudal. But the foundation of agriculture, formal agriculture, is rooted in violence. Mm. You don't ignore or demonetize the deaths of anyone in this book. Um, and while you explain why white genocide, the concept of white genocide is a myth, you and you have the research to back it, you don't condone the murder of anyone really, and, and you do include some pr- pretty horrific details of farm attacks, regardless of race, and yeah. mention that, uh, as we discussed earlier, that this has become a highly politicized and racial issue. Um, but you do strike a balance, I feel, to bring in the broader, more comprehensive context that's so necessary to understand how it is we got here. How did you strike that balance? Is it tempting to just leave out um, certain of the deaths or, or was it easy to kind of, we have to bring this in? I did want to strike a balance because um, it's important to me that we reminded that there's nobody left unaffected. And also this was a, a big challenge to me because from the outset, it's very easy to want to research this and say, oh, you know, so many of these farmers are racist and they've, if you look at the history, they're racist, they've beaten their workers, they've shot and killed their workers, they've raped their workers, they've, you know, there's years of indignity and, and horror. And, um, but then when you read the accounts of contemporary attacks, it's very apparent that, you know, people who get, let's say white families that get attacked or targeted, are, they're not targeted because they're bad people. I mean, there there are cases where there's a personal dispute between perpetrator and victim, but they're they're quite few and far between. People who suffer these kinds of things, even the whether it's the farm workers or the owners, it's it's because of the I don't know the horribleness of humanity, I suppose. And we need to humanize all of those people. So it's mm. not like only the bad farmers are the ones that get victimized, or and, and also, I suppose, the more I work through violence is, is this re- realization, I mean, I don't believe in the death penalty, although I understand why people do. And I've certainly had times in my life where 
I would have wished somebody dead, you know, a terrible, uh, you know, a very evil person or leader or something. Um, but I don't believe in the death penalty. And the more I study death and the various systems that surround violence and death in South Africa, the more I really have to affirm that nobody deserves this kind of violence. Like we're not, we're not good judges. We, we're not good at determining who does and who doesn't get to suffer. Um, the world and it doesn't seem to have any criteria for for kind of deciding who gets the luck, you know, the good luck and who doesn't. Um, people are suffering terribly. They are genuine. They're suffering through physical violence, through fear of violence, through loss of family, through trauma, through all of these things. And it's really important to acknowledge all of that. Um, there are so many examples of both sides of killings of farm laborers and killings of farm owners that I couldn't include simply just because there's too many stories to include. Um, but also when you do what I did, which is to literally read through tens of thousands of news articles about these kinds of events. Um, look, having said that also, the press does tend to humanize um, farm owners in its coverage of attacks and murders. It's very mm. sympathetic to them as victims, which we could compare to, for example, fem fem femicide victims. You know, if a if a woman is uh, drunk or killed by her jealous boyfriend because she was cheating on him, uh, um, they're covered a lot more critically, like a you know love triangle or somehow she somehow she was to blame. So a lot of the time, when when it comes to the coverage of women, there's a lot of implication that the woman was somehow partly to blame for her own death. Mm. You know, mm. Mm. she was drinking in the wrong place. Whereas we don't tend to do that with farmers. So the coverage is already sympathetic. And maybe that helps, you know, if you read enough of it, it is, it is sympathetic. Um, but it is, it's, it is genuinely a human bloody tragedy. It's, mm. This isn't something that you can ignore. And again, where I think this book is unlikely to sway the mind of anybody who is already um, convinced that there is a white genocide and that the farm killings are some targeted conspiracy, whatever. This book is not for them because I know I'm not going to succeed in changing their minds with facts because minds are often made up of emotion. But perhaps I was hoping that people who sit on the other side or slightly on the other side of the fence who think that ach farmers just complain a lot and you know is, maybe they'll read this and understand that what I keep saying is that everybody's in the same boat together. There, is, it's very much our safety is completely reliant on a common shared future it's not going to be safety for one and safe not safety for others you know we, we can't have different standards mm. um we can't have different goals otherwise it's not going to work for any of us anyway so that's the i mean maybe it's naive for me to you no, know well, imagine that in an era of cancel culture where things things have become so divisive and the this topic is you either it, it, it either is or it isn't and i really do feel like your work helps explain all the different nuances that have contributed to to what this is because it, it really is even I I don't completely as a journalist don't understand you know land appropriation without compensation or land expropriation without compensation I, it's it's a concept that even when I try to set my own emotions and my own history aside it's um I need to definitely look more into it and this but this yeah. helps in this context it helps um, and so for anybody who is jumping to sort of conclusions about what they how they think they feel about the topic, first read something like this and inform yourself, right? So I had earmarked several anecdotes and news items in the book that I'd really love to unpack, uh, but we'll be here for, for the rest of the day if we do. We only have so much time. I want to mention, just briefly touch on some of the the items that I earmarked, and that's the fact that there has been a committee of inquiry into a farm attacks, I think it was established in 2001, you mentioned. Yeah, how, it's quite old now, yeah. How the Kill the Boer song, which is a recent news item, thanks to EFF leader Julius Malema, how it dovetails with the lesser mentioned assassination of Chris Harney, private gun, gun ownership in South Africa, one of your last chapters, and the legacy of firearms on farms. These are all things that you really unpack in the book you get into yeah like, as yeah. i mentioned offering a comprehensive history of farming in south africa and importantly 
uh, what is left out of the narrative that is, um, you know, put onto 140 characters on Twitter. Now, thankfully more with yep. threads, but still it's, it's, you know, just given a snippet without the full context, do you offer that context? Do you feel like this is your, your work? You, I mean, we were discussing sort of off mic what, what you are doing or what you've done with Africa Check and now what you're doing in your work as, as a lecturer, as a journalist, your, the series that you are working on, this project that you're embarking on, do you think that your work as a journalist is to offer this context for a more correct and um, accurate understanding of the issues that plague our country? I hope so. I mean, studying violence is not particularly rewarding. Um, it's not it the sexiest me... of topics, right? <laughs> well, you know, they say, I mean, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. So mm. it makes good news headlines, but it's not personally very pleasant mm -mm. to do. Um, it's not pleasant at all. Um, in fact, my colleague Anton Harbour was asking me last week why, why I had such a morbid fascination. And I do think in addition to climate change, but I do think that crime and violence in South Africa is possibly the largest factor that drives people out of the country and that undermines community cohesion. Um, it's stopping us from being able to grow and improve as a country. It stops us from being able to enjoy not just the land, but any aspect of living here. Um, People come up with solutions for crime and violence that you know involve CCTV cameras and artificial intelligence, and everybody should own a gun, and we should have you know flamethrowers on the sides of our car. And none of those things are going to work, really. They're not. They're not solutions. Um, we're going to have to figure out a solution as a society and as members of that society. Uh, and somehow it's going to be about strengthening the social contract between us, where we all believe that other people have the right to live, that they have the right to safety, they have the right to enjoyment of their space and place. Um, and we're not there. Mm -hmm. um, so my contribution to that is, like I said, I, I really believe it's an absolutely pressing, pressing issue. I see other countries, you know, neighboring countries to South Africa where mm -hmm. the economy is worse and many other things are worse, but they don't kill each other all the time. And that changes the dynamic of your your ability to be optimistic about your country. So, I, you know, I hope that by producing better information, we can better understand how we got to this place and what useful, relevant solutions might be to improve it so that, you know, we, we could all enjoy a better quality of life. Mm. Not, you know, me, my, my children, my family. Um, God, imagine how... Imagine how amazing South Africa would be if you could walk down the street without being afraid. I can't imagine it right now. Mm. Have you, yeah. by any chance, I should have asked you this earlier, have you got a copy of your book on you right now? Is it nearby? Um, I had, wait, I have to sort of, I've, <laughs> I've been doing functions, so I think. I do, I have a Yay. copy here. So at the risk of taking something out of context, because context is a large part of our discussion now, mm. could you read the last paragraph of page 93? Page 93. Um, right. What this book hopefully shows is that while there is not necessarily a direct link or straight line between individual acts of violence, by which I mean that the farm laborer who is assaulted is not necessarily the one who goes and attacks a farmer and that the farmer who assaults his workers is not necessarily the one who gets attacked in turn. It is the constant presence of violence, the normalization of violence, the repeated use of violence to establish very masculine forms of dominance that enables the landscape of violent acts that continues to this day. I'm gonna leave it at that. Dr. Nkhama Brody, thank you for your work in upholding the truth here in South Africa. Facts over emotion and conflation. Um, what is next for you? You're almost off for a teaching stance in Norway. Yeah, I'm uh, more teaching and more teaching about violence and hopefully teaching other researchers to also um, study similar things. And I'm building 
research tools that will allow more researchers to access and to, to study media in different ways. So I'm trying to build open data tools for, for violence researchers. Well, thank you. Um, and on the writing front, we look forward to whatever the next installment might be. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you.